you see how careful I have to be even when I'm talking about, even now I'm thinking, what am I saying oh, that get might get me into trouble? I mean, it's terrible to live that way with this, this voice in your head, all these decades later saying, if I say the wrong thing, I could get in trouble. I don't want Britain to be that country. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is the novelist and writer Kamala Shamsi. Now Kamala is probably most famous for her novel Home Fire, which I think was number seven in her list of it was. in a list of books, but won the Women's Prize for Fiction, was shortlisted for the Booker and got a lot of attention because of the topics it, it picked up on. And her current book, which is out in paperback, is Best of Friends. You may also have seen her writing in Vogue and The Guardian and New Statesman and all sorts of other um, progressive left-leaning um, <laughs> Coincidentally, <places. laughs> yes. Um, and, and Kamala, I mean, you, you grew up in Karachi, mm. but you're, you're British now. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, are you, I mean, I, yeah. are you, are you British, Pakistani, Pakistani, but what are you? I am British and Pakistani. Right. You know, I mean, I had, uh, when I'm watching cricket, I'm very Pakistani. Um, but I've been living in London for the last 16 years. This is home and Karachi's home in a different way. I mean, I don't think one has to be particularly monogamous to the idea of a nation or a home. Um, yeah. Um, and it's, you know, of course, the really significant thing about citizenship is it affords you certain rights and gives you a passport. And I have that for two countries. And I think people should get as many of them as possible, really. <laughs> have as many rights Just in, in, as case. Ma- in as many places. Well, I mean, um, you, you, you've this. mentioned before, mm. I know, that you were wary about writing in mm. Britain before you got your yeah. British citizenship. Yeah. Just explain why. So Home Fire is the first novel that I wrote post citizenship, really. Um, And I realized as I was writing it that there was no way I would have written it while living in Britain and in the process of applying for, you know, extension of your leave to stay here because it's critical of the government. It's critical of um, attitudes towards migration. And there is at the back of your head, I think, when you're in that process of application, this idea, you know, Anyone in the home office has a certain level of discretion when dealing with an application. And if someone, you know, looks me up or happens to have read something by me and doesn't like what I have to say, that might just be reason for them to say, well, we don't think you should stay any longer. Um, It was rather chilling to have that feeling because I was someone, you know, I'm a good citizen as it were. I mean, well, I was going to say, do you think Britain is that sort of corrupt? I think... Britain increasingly is a country that wants to find a way to keep out as many migrants as possible, to keep numbers down. It's very number oriented. Um, I think that we have seen all kinds of people being turned down for citizenship on the basis of reasons that um, are later thrown out by courts. So clearly the courts don't think they're right and legal and fair. Um, But actually what was possibly even more worrying was When I wrote Home Fire, by that point, I was a British citizen. And there was still a little bit of my brain that was quite concerned because I was writing about, among other things, um, a young man who is groomed by ISIS. And when I sat down to write the book, um, I was very self-conscious about what I wanted to look up online, what I wanted my search history to look like, um, that I wasn't going to go up, go in and just type in ISIS recruitment. Yes. And, and it's interesting because at the same moment, the writer Julian Slover, who's a friend of mine, was working on a play for the National Theatre on a similar topic. Um, and I said to her, are you, are you worried? And she said, no, but I'm white. Um, and I've been here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from South Africa and I'm white, but I can understand why you have your concerns. Um, and there, was, there were sort of two parts of my brain. There was one part of my brain which said, I'm a writer, this is my seventh novel. Um, I have a track record. If, Of course, this is a subject for fiction. What's the problem with it? Um, and there was another part of my brain that said, I don't want to 
raise too many red flags. I want to make sure that people such as my publisher and my agent know what I'm working on so that if someone knocks on my door saying, why are you looking up these things? I have, you know, backup. And, and the there's a phrase that made its way in the novel, which is Googling while Muslim. Um, and it very much came from my own feelings of anxiety about Googling while Muslim. And, and does Googling while Muslim yeah. raise the, the anxiety of, of that, you know, having got your citizenship, it could be taken away? Um, well, increasingly, as, as the book went on and I realized how, you know, how much space there is within citizenship laws, particularly for the naturalized citizen, uh, for those to be taken away. I don't think I wasn't pressing. I wasn't pressingly worried that my citizenship would be taken away um, because I did have enough. It was my first novel. I might have been. But I did feel like I've, I've been around a while. You know, I've been on test mat special, for God's sake. How, how can you be any safer than that? Um, but I, I was a little worried about someone coming to inquire. That was, that was in my head. I mean, because Home Fire obviously referenced a, a British Home Secretary mm. who, was a, who was a Muslim. Um, and of course we saw Sajid Javid and mm. Sajid Javid took away mm. the citizenship mm. um, of mm. Shamima Begum. Mm. Well, well, the book was written before yeah. Sajid Javid became Home Secretary. Um, I'm, I'm, I would probably be more worried about it now. I mean, at the, at the moment that I, I wrote it was well before that. Had, I was writing it in 2015. So, so when, he, and, when you've heard him say, mm, yeah. I've seen the intelligence, it can't be published, mm. um, but you have to trust me on this. Mm. Um, it was the right thing to do. She was mm. a threat. Mm. What do you think? I was, I was really horrified because as a result of writing this book, I was looking up a lot around the citizenship laws and how you can take citizenship away. Um, and of course, you know, someone like me who I became British at the age of 40, uh, Shamima Begum was born in Britain, has never lived anywhere else um, and didn't have a second passport. You know, she is in Bangladeshi. And um, my understanding of the laws around stripping citizenship was, you know, she She's never had another passport. Really, she should belong to this a category of people where it shouldn't be possible. But but you know, he was able to say because of Bangladesh's laws, um, it would be possible for her to apply for a Bangladeshi passport because her parents were from there. And the Bangladesh government said we would never give her citizenship. They made it very clear that she would not get another citizenship. And what Saja Javed did was to make her stateless which is against international law. Um, and in my book, you know, no one goes quite that far. You know, yeah. the, um, there, there is a sort of a second citizenship lurking around for the character to whom it happens. But, but if that is a sort of an, a straightforward yeah. wrong for you, mm. it, I mean, what about what is she, she is accused of oh, look, I doing? I mean, I, do, does it matter what she is accused of doing? I think the laws of citizenship stripping in unjust because you have to have one set of laws for all British citizens. It's just that straightforward. So first of all, it shouldn't be possible to say, well, if you are British and your parents have lived in Britain for generations and generations, well, then we can never strip you of citizenship. But if your parents or grandparents were migrant, then you're in this other category. Well, first of all, how is that a just and fair nation if there is a two-tiered um, citizenship law? Beyond that, surely you need to trust your own judicial system. You have laws, you have intelligence services, you have a system of justice. I'm not saying everyone who went off to join ISIS or go and live in Raqqa should just be allowed back in without any questions, but, but you have certain systems in place and you need to trust them. And if you have to, um, you know, take a lot of time and effort into figuring out what someone did somewhere else, well, then you need to do that. But you can't say our system of justice is inadequate to these particular problems. So we will just leave you out of the country so we don't have to deal with it. Having grown up in Pakistan mm. and looking at what's going on in Pakistan, I presume you still got family mm. in Pakistan. You know, what, what do you make of the sort of the whole, Britain is the best place to be if you're an immigrant. You know, it's the most tolerant country, whatever it might be. Um, or if you're worried about how Britain treats people, well, look at how Pakistan treats them. Um, you know, how do you respond to that sort of the comparative um, look at, at, at human rights? I just say, don't be silly. You know, you, 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 why? You, I'm, I'm hardly going to stand up and make an argument that Pakistan is a better place for migrants. Um, but what does that have to do with it? 
you know, it's it's another version of if you can't be grateful, go back to where you came from is actually what's at the bottom of that argument. And I don't have any time for any go back to where you came from arguments. Now, now you're writing, I think, um, it's it's very political in that politics actually mm. has a direct effect on people's lives, the, mm. the, pe the people you're writing about. Mm. They are mm. they are political beings and they respond to the environment they're in. Mm. Um, and I wonder whether that's because you're from Pakistan, where, where politics does, I think, have mm. a more direct effect than, than for many people in this country. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to think of these as separate things. You know, if I'm to think of my earliest memories, um, they include when I was three or four, and there, it was 1977, um, and there were elections in Pakistan. And I remember my father showing me um, an indelible ink print on his thumb and saying, this is to prevent people from voting twice when you go to vote. You know, I was three, why? but I remember that very clearly. And possibly I remember it clearly because very soon after that, there was a coup. But of course, you remember these things in the way of an individual living a particular life. So my earliest memory of General Muhammad Zia al -Haq, the dictator who ruled Pakistan from the time I was four to 15, was actually waiting to see Little House on the Prairie, which was on TV, um, which was my favorite TV show at the time. And the president, military dictator, decided to come on television to address the nation. I have no idea what he was addressing the nation about, but I do know that because he was addressing the nation live, they didn't show Little House on the Prairie. And I just thought, this is a bad man, <laughs> you know? Um, so, I mean, I think in the, in the novels, what I'm concerned with is how the, f the stuff of politics enters people's lives. I was six when um, Zia al -Haq hanged Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was the-, the Benazir Bhutto's father. Benazir Bhutto's father, who was the previous democratically elected prime minister. But again, the way I remember this was I was at school and um, the, father of one of my friends came to pick up his sons and my sister and me from school in the middle of the school day because he'd spoken to my parents. They'd heard that Bhutto had just been hanged and they thought there might be a lot of trouble and riots and violence in the city. So they wanted to get us all out. But I just remember it was thrilling to leave school early with your friends uh, with no real explanation. So, you know, political events have always been part of my memory of growing up. Um, but I also know that how they affect you, you know, uh, depends on who you are, where you're sitting, how old you are. And when you write mm. in um, mm. Best of Friends about the end of Zia, the mm. arrival of Benazir Bhutto, mm. or the election of Benazir Bhutto, mm. when democracy was returned for a while mm. um, to, to, to Pakistan in the late 80s, was, was that your experience you were writing about? Yes, and, and I don't know why it took me until my eighth novel to do it, because it was such a significant moment in my life. I was, I was 15, um, and in, in August that year, um, a bomb went off on the plane that Zia al-Haq was in. And I remember when I heard the news, um, it was a friend of my parents called and my parents were out. I answered the phone, of course, this was landline. So you, you know, a phone rings and anyone answers it. Um, and this friend who's really like an aunt said, said, are your parents home? And I said, I said, no, they're out. And she said, as soon as they get back, tell them Ziaul Haq has been killed. His plane exploded above Bhaulpur. Uh, Bhaulpur was the city where she had a lot of family. And I said, okay, and I hung up. And then my parents came home and several hours went by. And then my mother came running into the room where I was with my father and possibly my sister and said, Zia al has been killed. And I said, oh yes, <laughs> I knew that. Yeah, you should have said. Um, and my parents looked at, I, no, I didn't say I knew that. I said, oh yes, aunt so-and-so called to say. And my parents said, why didn't you say it? And I said, oh, she's always full of tall tales. And I sort of believed that explanation until I was writing Best of Friends and I had to rethink it. And I realized actually, I didn't believe it was possible. I didn't believe it was possible he could be dead because he had just been this larger than life figure ruling over all of us almost as long as I could remember. And then when the talk started about how there would be elections, I remember also thinking, well, no, of course not. If you've had military ruler, he'll be replaced by another military ruler. Um, I couldn't believe in the possibility of this very dramatic change towards something better. And then it just, at some point, started to become clear that elections would happen. And 
I tell you, I feel so fortunate to have lived, to have been young in that moment um, and to learn in that moment that history can turn and not always for the worse. Um, I think it's a very useful thing to carry with you, particularly these days. Um, so that was a very hopeful moment. It was a very hopeful. I mean, there was just, it was just, it felt like a party. Karachi, there was just music and, and, and Benazir's um, election camp, all the political parties had a song, a theme song for the election campaign. And Benazir's was particularly catchy um, and had this kind of disco beat. Um, and we used to just sing it and dance to it um, all the time. And it was just, it was glorious. And when she was, um, the night of elections, I stayed up all night watching the election results come in. Um, and the day she was inaugurated, I just remember visually, it was so striking, this, this woman. First of all, there had never been a woman at that level of politics. And there she was standing in, in this green shalwar kameez with a white dupatta on her head, taking the oath of office. And behind her were these, you know, military men. Um, and next to her were these bureaucrats. And these were all the people who, you know, whose institutions had been responsible for the hanging of her father and sending her into exile and the imprisonment and torture of her party workers. And there she was. How, having witnessed that then, mm. I mean, how do you feel about apathy in British politics and the way we think of democracy or take democracy for granted, perhaps? So I believed at the time, even though, I mean, of course, you know, you quickly get disillusioned as well. And, and to be disillusioned at 15 or 16 is heartbreaking. Um, but I did believe even so that, that, that around the world history was moving in a certain direction for the better. Because, you know, there was the end of dictatorship in Pakistan and then the Berlin Wall fell and, you know, the Cold War came to an end and Mandela was freed from prison. I mean, we, you know, it was just a space of three or four years this happened in. Um, and it seemed to me this inexorable movement towards a more progressive state of affairs, even though I had no idea what the word progressive was at the time. Um, and I started to get quite bothered. Um, in the UK, it's not so much, it, it, it hasn't started recently. I think for a lot of people, there's, there's been a moment around Brexit in the last few years of, of feeling what's going on. Um, but for me, it was around the war on terror 7-7 seven, seven. Um, and to see how quickly civil liberties were being rolled back in the name of security. Because, of course, that is the classic line of all dictatorships, is to say you have a choice between security and liberties. Um, and anyone who has grown up in that kind of government knows it for the lie that it is. Um, and when I saw how quickly, I mean, I'd, I'd studied in America, it was a country I knew well. I was, you know, already spending a lot of time in London. Um, when I saw how quickly these countries were rolling back civil liberties, um, I saw, and, and there weren't mass protests on the streets. What sorts of liberties are you talking about? Are you talking about detention without trial detention and 99 with, days and all that kind of thing? All, all that kind of thing. And, and you know, it, it, the ways it became possible to, um, the, the rather flimsy reasons on which it became possible to arrest people, all those anti-terror laws. Um, it, it, and, and, there, and there wasn't mass outrage and people taking to the streets. And that was the point I thought, you don't know what you have because you've had it so long. Um, and that means you don't recognize how terrifying it is when it starts being taken away from you. And do you think that's still the case, that people don't know what they have in this country? I think there is, there is more concern now I think there's considerable more concern now um, about the state of democracy. Um, you know, things like the prorogation of parliament and, um, and when you have your government attacking judges um, and things like that. I think, there, I think there are more people concerned now, but I wouldn't say it's a mass sort of well, movement I mean, of outrage. Yeah, I mean, it also depends what your world is in this country, doesn't it? Yeah. Because there is still, you know, for, for, for lots of yeah. people in, 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 in Britain, mm. You know, politics doesn't really have a daily um, sort of impact. On, it has an impact on their lives, but but it doesn't um, impinge on their daily conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 in some, you know, I, I think for some people, it's it's almost a dirty dirty topic. You know, you don't, don't talk about politics. But you know, don't, we don't want to talk about that. You know, you, you talk. You know, your your people mm -hmm. talk about politics. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, I wonder, you know, I, I do wonder about this, don't talk about politics, whether that's not also a sort of a certain group of people who would say that. Um, I think when austerity came in, I think anyone who was finding that um, the welfare system was not working for them in the way it should, I suspect they were talking about politics, a lot of them, um, at that moment. But don't a lot of people it's, tune out as well and just believe all politicians are the same, there are no answers? You know, that's the other way that that conversation can go, where people just give up on politics. I think they're probably still thinking about it. I mean, to be disillusioned with people um, and to think they're not working for you, um, that they are only interested in themselves and their own political career or their donors or their political party. I still think that, you know, something like, let's say, the NHS. Um, I think people are very concerned about the NHS. I think a lot of people make a connection between what is going on with the NHS and government policy. You know, um, so even if you're not talking about it in an overt way, um, any moment you're talking about how long you might have to wait at the A&E or what was available on the NHS that no longer is, um, any time you're talking about how your um, benefits are being curtailed, how you're being made to go to work when you're not in a state of mind or physical ability to go to work, you're talking about politics. And anytime you're talking about inflation these days, although we pretend there's still this pretense it has nothing to do with Brexit, um, but you are talking about politics. And, and do, you, do you think the last, well, I suppose the period since mm. 2015, mm. of Brexit, populist politics, mm. Trump, Johnson, mm. and lots of other people around the world, have they, has that changed? the way we feel politics? I think so. You know, one of the reasons that why I ended up writing Best of Friends was around 2016, whether in America or the UK, I was hearing so many conversations where people would say, you know, well, there's this person in my life, whether it's a family member or a close friend or a colleague. And, and, and I've always known we see things differently, but it's always been possible to carry on a relationship regardless, and now it no longer is. Now I can't speak to this person anymore. Um, you know, there, I think there was this moment where, where people realised it, it's personal. Do you think that has lasted? I mean, do you think that's... Because there, there were lots of conversations mm. about how families were mm. being divided around Brexit, mm. for example, mm -hmm. um, and similar conversations in America around Trump. Yeah. I think the larger problem in the last few is the wrong... Th certain things have been said and accepted as true when they're not, you know. So perhaps that's where, where you see something being claimed that isn't true and you decide to let it go. I think that, that really does become a problem because that claim becomes larger and larger and the other person's certainty that they are right about this claim becomes larger and larger and absolutely embedded in concrete. So in terms of sort of, um, you know, narratives that are accepted that may yeah. or may not be true, at the moment mm. um, there is a narrative mm. from both the main political parties mm. that there are too many people coming to Britain. Um, is that true? No. I mean, it's not. Um, it's, it's not true. And you're, and you're having that conversation. At the same time, you're, you're seeing, you know, shortages in all kinds of occupations and including the NHS. And we know how much, and again, let's keep going back to the NHS because it, I grew up in a country without an NHS. I remember the first time I was able to use the NHS and I was able to go in and see a doctor without a bill. And I just remember almost wanting to cry. It felt so extraordinary to me. Um, and, and then I thought, you know, I mean, and I could have afforded to go in to see a doctor, but I remember looking around and thinking, there is no one in this country who can say, I can't get the medicine I need, I can't get the surgery I need because I don't have the money for it. And it seemed to me the most wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and, and then, of course, you notice how much of the NHS is staffed by people who've come from somewhere else. And that also felt wonderful to me. And that now we're in a situation where the NHS is in such peril 
and also being understaffed. Um, and at the same time, we're having this conversation about too many migrants, you know. And it also feels very silly because I would never hold Pakistan up as exemplary in its treatment of, of anyone. Um, and certainly not in its treatment of migrants and refugees. The fact is that during the Afghanistan wars, Pakistan did have refugees totaling in the millions. I do not remember conversations in Pakistan. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's bigotry. There is certain bigotry. But the kind of conversations you're having in Britain about we can't take any more refugees, the flood of migrants and these terrible people and how that has become, you know, front pages of newspapers, you just didn't see it. And so when I see those kinds of conversations being had with a fraction of the number coming in, into a country that is so much wealthier. Is it more effective to make the argument that there are too many people coming into Britain if you are yourself a brown-skinned child of immigrants? Yes, of course, because then you can say, and, and of course I'm not being racist, how could I? Because I'm the brown-skinned child of immigrants. Um, as if you can't hold racist ideas or you can't express ideas that you know um, will help you get into certain positions um, just because of the colour of your skin. Well, that's suggesting that you think it is racist. Do you think it's racist? Yes. And why do you think it's racist? Well, I think quite. we've seen quite recently, I mean, let's just look in the last year or two, have we had the same conversation around Ukrainian refugees as around Syrian refugees? No, we have not. Why is that? Do, do we really have to unpack this and, and pretend that, that there, there may be many reasons? And, well, and don't we, for the same reason that you say we accept mm -hmm. narratives? That yeah, okay, well, are, so let's unpack we, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then the argument is, but of course, they're European and they look like us. Well, okay, well, then you're acknowledging that, that your problem with other refugees is based on race. You just acknowledged it. If you say there's one rule for Ukrainians and another for Syrians, and another for Sudanese, then you are yourself acknowledging that race is the basis of this argument. And you will have seen Suella Braverman being furious in the House mm -hmm. of Commons a couple of times about yes. these allegations that she is advancing a racist narrative. Well, you know, what do you make of that when you hear her say she is the victim of racism and, and this is outrageous? Well, it's very convenient. It's very convenient to be able to say, to, to take on this posture of outrage and to say, I can't possibly be racist. How dare you say I'm racist? Um, it's incredibly convenient. And it also, I mean, the thing that, that really saddens me is, you know, I know there are a lot of people who've said, well, whatever people's politics, it's, it's wonderful for the children of migrants or migrants themselves, young people growing up in Britain to see that you can get to the highest level of office um, without being white. And I disagree. I think it's actually very damaging if what you're learning, if, if you're looking around and you're saying, but the people who are getting to those positions feel the need to advance a really racist narrative in order to do that. And that's the choice. Is that the choice you have to make? Um, if you are Asian and British, do you have to choose whether you're going to turn on brown-skinned people and make the most extraordinary racist comments about them, or you don't get to occupy high office. Is that what you think, though? Because that, again, is it's a very dim view of how British politics and the establishment works. I'm saying it's, it's, it's the narrative that you'd look at. Now, I would very, very much hope that next year, let's, let's, let's hypothesize that next year, with elections, you get a new government in. I would very much want that government to have at its highest levels, well, maybe not the very highest because that's already sort of set, but at very high levels, um, I would want to see people who are not white occupying positions such as Home Secretary um, and then not feeling the need to further these racist narratives. I want it possible for a person who is brown-skinned to say, actually, we have signed up to all kinds of conventions. We have obligations to refugees. 
we will not look at the color of their skin or the country from which they're coming. I mean, we touched on it earlier when talking about Pakistan, but you must also be an expert in managing expectation and disappointment because that's what's happened in Pakistani politics. It certainly happened mm -hmm. with Benazir Bhutto. Mm -hmm. You know, did you end up feeling angry with Benazir Bhutto? Furious, of course. You're 15 and someone, this 35-year-old woman has come along and you put all your hopes there. Um, and then you feel very, very disappointed and furious. And, and it takes some growing up to recognize that, that, of course, some of that disappointment does go directly to the individual, but that a lot of it has to do with the structures of power in place that did not want her to succeed. Right. You know, I mean, we, we so do... So it wasn't just her fault? No, of course it wasn't just her fault. I mean, we do know because there was there was a, a court case around this and, and information came up that we know that um, her removal from power was orchestrated. And you see how careful I have to be even when I'm talking about... Even now I'm thinking, what am I saying <laughs> am that I might get, get me into trouble? I mean, it's terrible to live that way with this this voice in your head all these decades later saying, if I say the wrong thing... I could get in trouble. I don't want Britain to be that country. Do you think she was corrupted? There was a lot of corruption going on. Um, in, in well, that, that's definitely true. The question is whether she yeah. was part of it, in your mind. Um, in my mind, it, it's hard not to, it's hard for that level of things to go on um, without you knowing it's going on. But my, my larger concerns well, I mean, people always go to personal corruption for good reason. I mean, you don't want your political leaders to be corrupt. But the question is, what are you doing legislatively? What are you doing for welfare? What are you doing, you know, beyond that? And I think that needs to be, and we need to stop talking as though the centrally most important thing about our political leaders is their personal lives and look at what they're doing for the country. Um, and what they're doing to the country. Um, and that has, and uh, again, I'm not saying ignore or, or set aside. And, and of course, there's a connection and there's a very strong correlation between uh, personality and politics. Um, but I do think we need to be talking about the stuff people find is boring. Like all that rolling back of civil liberties, all those bits of legislation um, around um, anti terrorism laws that just felt a little bit tedious. Um, I think we need the conversation to center again on what does this mean for our lives? What does this mean for the atmosphere in which we're living? What does this mean for our ability um, to lead lives of dignity? I mean, the number of children in this country who can't afford to be fed in a first world country, why is this not? the most pressing news story of our times. Um, so I'm not that interested in sitting and rehashing what one individual's personal failings were. You know, because I think that's part of our, our problem is, is also this sort of- The cult of personality the cult around of personality. leaders. Yeah, I yeah. think we need to get, get rid of it. Is that possible though? I mean, the way, the way politics is arranged. I mean, politics is arranged around charismatic leaders at the moment, isn't it? It's arranged around charismatic leaders at the moment. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't be talking about other kinds of stories. Um, you know, what is, what is the effect of poverty in this country? What is, what is going on at food banks? You know, follow, follow a food bank for a few months. See who comes in there, make, make that a reality show, except, I mean, not in the horrible way of a reality show, um, but it's people's lives. You know, this is the thing you learn as a writer you invent characters. Everyone I've written about, it's a piece of fiction. They're not going to change the world because they don't really exist. And yet, if I write about them in enough detail, people get tremendously caught up in them. Um, you don't have to be a prime minister or a professional footballer for people to be interested in your lives. You just need someone to convey those lives and say, look at this person, here's their life, begin to care. And, and have you found it 
easy to find new things to write about. Um, the world does not run out of stories. I mean, as human beings, we are storytelling creatures. You know, we just are. It's it's how we it's how we try and create a sense of control through chaos. It's an absolutely essential tool um, to you know functioning in the world. And you and you say you don't write to sort of change people's minds about mm -hmm. things necessarily. But I mean, um, but as we've discovered, um, not only are your books very political, but you are. Well, you know, you ask me certain questions. Yeah. I'm answering them in certain ways. I can have. We could have had a very long conversation about, you know, pop music of the 80s and, and George Michael and Bruce Springsteen <laughs> if you wanted. But, you know, and I can do that also. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, again, but again, when you say things like that, you're very political. I sort of shrug and say, well, I mean, I live in the world. Yeah. You know, I care about my life and the people around me and, and the people who I see walking along and, and whether, um, you know, whether it's possible to go and get treated for an ailment regardless of the size of your bank balance and um, whether your passport allows you to visit other countries where people you love live, you know, things like that. It can be called politics, but it's life. And are you, are you um, following what's going on in Pakistan at the moment? Because I wonder how you feel about Imran Khan, given, um, you know, you, you will have seen him because mm -hmm. you love cricket as mm -hmm. well, I know. Yeah. And you, you must have loved him yeah. as a cricketer. Yeah. But he's very much a sort of a populist politician yeah. who's now been... Mm -hmm. um, pushed out, mm -hmm. um, he says, by the army. Mm -hmm. How do you see his story within? I mean, it's a fascinating Pakistan. story as a novelist. Um, I loved him as a cricketer. His politics are not my politics and never have been. Um, and at the same time, I think you have to believe, you have to allow a democratic process to happen, even when it's giving you leaders who are not the leaders you would have chosen. Um, you have to allow that process to happen. And if you could change the world in any way, how mm -hmm. would you change it? So last year, the floods in Pakistan uh, submerged an area equivalent to the size of the UK. And 33 million people's lives were affected. Um, and the most terrifying part of it was that it didn't feel like a freakish once in a century, once in a millennia event. It felt like this is a sign of what the new normal is going to be. The climate catastrophe is here. It is a catastrophe. Um, we need those carbon emissions to just go down very fast. Um, and it has to be, it can't be done through hopes and promises in another 20 years and 50 years. This is what we aim for. Um, I think that it has to be done via government legislation. Um, we have to take it that seriously. It is right now, the countries who are least responsible for emissions are the ones who are suffering the most. Um, and that makes it possible for the wealthier nations of the world not to look at the size and scale of the problem. Um, but really, we've never seen anything like it. Um, and, you know, other, all other things in history, you can say, well, you know, history isn't pendulums. Things come and go. Not this. Kamala Shamsi, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.